What's it? Wait, we'll give everybody a few seconds to, to settle and for us to work out what we're doing. We're newbies. <laughs> so bear with us. <laughs> Thank you. Right, shall I start? So um, welcome to the latest CIPR Yorkshire and Lincolnshire webinar. Uh, today's session is called The Science Behind Award-Winning Campaigns. It will run for one hour, and I believe it's worth five CPD points. So be, before we kick off, we'll uh, just kind of give you a bit of a brief intro, um, some information about the CIPR, first of all. Um, and I'm a member of the CIPR Yorkshire and Lincolnshire Committee, which is running this event. So the CIPR is the world's only royal chartered professional body for PR practitioners. It has 10,000 members and it's on a mission ultimately to set, maintain and advance standards in PR. So it offers qualifications, CPD, accreditation and chartership, produces various best practice guidance and has an ethical code of conduct. And it also operates an iProvision charity, which you can donate to and which helps uh, PR practitioners who've fallen on hard times. And finally, it runs a couple of awards programmes. So it's a nice little segue, the CIPR Excellence Awards and the CIPR Pride Awards. And so that's what today's session is all about, uh, how you win those awards uh, and looking at the science behind award-winning campaigns. So the webinar split into uh, three or four sections. Um, we have a Q&A uh, or a chat function. Um, I can't see those at the moment, so we're not ignoring you, but we'll pick up those questions at the end. Um, and the session will be recorded and posted to YouTube. Uh, introduction to today's speakers. Um, so I'll go first. I'm Lee Greenwood, a chartered PR professional, uh, managing director of Evergreen PR. Uh, and the purpose for me to be on this session really is, is talking about um, that process of winning awards. Evergreen has been lucky enough to win sort of 10, 12 awards in our first couple of years. So I'll be talking a little bit about that experience uh, and, and, and how, we, how we've managed that. And I'll hand over to my colleagues now. Hi, I'm Adiba Hussain. I'm a freelance communications consultant, also a member of uh, CIPR, uh, but also a member of CIPR Northwest Committee. And I um, am a member of uh, AMEC, uh, the International Measurement and Evaluation uh, Communications um, Association. Um, I'm also certified through their certification. And I work and I'm looking to set my own consultancy up in the next couple of weeks. Um, and I work closely with organisations around measurement and evaluation of the employee experience. And I hand over to Nafisa. Hello, I am Nafisa Shafi. I am the Student Communications and Engagement Manager at the University of Leeds. I'm a member of a leader like me. I have recently graduated from Socially Mobile. I'm a member of CIPR and PRCA, not a volunteer at the moment, but I think Tila is it classes me as a friend of CIPR. Um, so I get wheeled in when you need me and when you want me. So I tend to join a few things. Um, I'm also um, a Pride judge. So I've judged um, one of the entries last year in the Pride Awards. And generally, I'm a mum of two. My child might try to turn up because we're on the 48 hour rule, or she's still in the house. She's downstairs, we've tried to block the door, so if she does turn up, she will try to come in through here. Thank you guys, cheers. So um, yeah, thank you all for spending your lunchtime with us uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll start today's session. So the first thing, the first point to make really is that uh, for us, we believe entering, entering awards is not a vanity or, or a luxury, it's actually a really important part of assessing and improving the quality of our work. Uh, and that's for a number of reasons. Ultimately, if you, if you keep, when you're planning your campaigns and working on activity, if you keep awards criteria in mind, 
you tend to do better work because it encourages you to follow best practice. Uh, that process of entering awards as well, uh, often it will be several months after the campaign that you've delivered uh, when you come to fill in the award entry. And that process encourage, encourages an even deeper reflection uh, and evaluation of the work that you've done. So you look at things with fresh eyes uh, and you tend to, to learn uh, even more about what, what you did that worked so well and how you can do things differently and, and put those things into practice uh, with your next campaign. And, and lastly, it keeps you current uh, because you need to be constantly learning uh, and updating your practice if you're going to be competing with the, with the very best in the industry. So again, it's, uh, it, it's just a great way to, to ensure that you're working to the best of your ability. And at a time when recruitment and retention is such a big challenge uh, in PR, but across uh, all businesses, it's worth remembering that people like to work for award-winning businesses and like to work in award-winning teams. Uh, and there's lots of common traits that you see uh, in teams that, that, that are winning awards. They tend to enjoy their work because it's uh, professionally satisfying. They are more motivated because they feel they're doing great work and are making a difference. Their clients or, or their bosses or managers are, are happy because they're helping them to achieve the outcomes that they value. And other people, teams and organisations want to work with them because it helps their, their reputation. They have a reputation for delivering excellent work that, that wins awards and delivers outcomes. So today's session is all about how, do, how, is it, how is it that you make your campaigns award winning? And the first section we'll look at is, uh, is what we're terming the science. So, so when asked to deliver this webinar, we wanted to make sure that it was rooted in solid foundations so that we could be more definitive about the key elements of award winning campaigns and it, and it wasn't only opinion. Uh, so we started with some analysis of the major awards uh, and the criteria that they ask for. And if you take a look at that table with the columns uh, uh, along, along the top, you can see that the wording is maybe slightly different in certain places, but there is an enormous amount of crossover. And uh, as a result, the kind of things that awards uh, planners and judges are looking for is fairly similar across all of the, the major PR awards uh, categories. And the other good thing is that those categories or those criteria align really well with best practice models. So from Anne Gregory's 10 point planning model on the left to the AMEC evaluation and planning framework to the uh, GCS model, so used by the government communication service, they all follow a similar uh, planning uh, steps ultimately to get people to the place where they want to go in terms of delivering outcomes. And in terms of summarizing those criteria, ultimately they are what you would expect to see in typical PR planning uh, tools. You're measuring against objectives, research and planning, strategy, tactics, creativity and outcomes. Uh, last year, I uh, judged the National CIPR Excellence and PR Week Healthcare Awards. So received 27 different award entries or judged 27 different award entries for, for a number of different categories. And so as part of this process, we decided to go back and score each of those award entries again afresh against those six criteria that, that we'd identified for, for the webinar. And you can see in this table on the right that um, how, they, how they fared. And ultimately, green is where criteria were comfortably met. Yellow is where the criteria were partly met. And red is where the criteria just weren't met at all. And then we've scored those at the bottom. But it's quite hard to compute. There's lots of different colors, lots of different numbers. So we've um, drilled that down a little here. And so this slide looks at how many scored highly in each of the categories. So we had of those 27 entries, 54% scored highly for objectives, 43% for research and planning, 36% strategy, 96% for tactics, 39% creativity, and 32% for outcomes. 
so really you can standing out are the tactics and the outcomes really at each end of the scale in terms of those 96 percent of tactics you know that's nearly every entry did really well in terms of that and it's and it's not surprising really um tactics are, are pretty easy to list uh if you're under pressure for of time or or, or seeing activity pushed out of the door quite often people feel under pressure to jump straight to tactics been set an objective but maybe missing out the research planning and strategy uh, and and ultimately in pr too many campaigns do start at this more tactical level whereas at the other end of the scale we've got 32 percent on outcomes uh, and the reason they scored so scored more lowly in that in that category is that too many entries and and indeed too many campaigns focus more on out outputs or activity and on vanity metrics uh, and, and not enough on impact uh, and ultimately not enough campaigns start here with the outcome in mind um you can see there that others scored low lower too so strategy and creativity um and, and we can talk a little bit more about why that was in, in a second so so that's kind of how they score but what is it about the campaigns that performed best and then went on to win the awards uh, and how did they perform well in each of these criteria what was it that they did so from from an objectives point of view they were outcomes focused you know they focused on specifically what they wanted to happen what they wanted to change they had smart objectives so specific measurable achievable resourced and timely and they were set in context so they explained the challenge that had to be overcome uh, and what barriers had to be worked around to be able to get there so that that's kind of how the that's how the best entries performed for objectives from a research and planning point of view uh it was kind of twofold so uh they described the frameworks that were used to to enable them to, to get the insight that they got but more importantly they pulled out the really interesting key insights from all of that research and work behind the scenes what were the key insights that defined the direction that they took with the strategy going forward and plucking those out is so important from a judging perspective because you can understand why they did what they did from a from a strategy point of view the strategies of the best entries were were clear they were insight led um, and they were clearly targeted at the outcome so we understood why they did it and it was clear that they pointed towards the outcome that the campaign wanted to see the tactics is that detailed steps of the activity and you know we don't need to give any tips here 96 percent of, of entries did this really really well from a creativity point of view um it's important to note here i think that uh the, the best entries were not creativity for creativity's sake they weren't bolted on they were informed by the insight, targeted at the audience, uh, and specifically designed to help achieve the outcome. So it's not the most creative campaign that wins, it's the campaign that the creativity is most uh, likely to help achieve the outcome. And then from an outcomes perspective, um, that, that it is that word, it's outcomes. So what was the business impact? So the best entries showed a real business impact. They had data, uh, as proof and evidence of what they'd achieved and they were able to show as well another important thing that the impact came from the campaign that they delivered it wasn't sort of it didn't happen anyway uh, and they didn't and while and vanity metrics so you know things like big reach and circulation of media coverage for example that could be included but it was not front and center that was more positioned as something that supported and helped on the journey towards the outcome and all of this stuff was ultimately wrapped around with a strong story that brought the entry together um, the outcome and the impact was a, was a kind of central thing for the entry uh, and that was probably the thing that, that most of the entries missed i'll hand over now to adiba thank you lee so i think of I'm going to sort of talk about outcomes versus outputs and refer to some of the research that uh, Lee had conducted when he went through all those awards. So I think of communications as storytelling. So when you're planning communications, campaigns, writing, I ask, or everybody should be asking the question, 
how do I get to the end and know what I've shared is of value, effective and meaningful? The end is what I want the audience and all of us should be thinking about the audience. So shall I say, rather than I, we want the audience, employees to know, to feel or to do after they receive the communications that we've sent them, the content we've shared with them, the campaign that we've rolled out. So that we want them to act differently, to do something differently, to know something differently. So where do we start when it comes to measurement? Some analysis and measurement specialists say begin with defining what the outcome, the business wants or needs. I, in the words of Stephen Corby, say begin with the end in mind, which is the impact you or the business wants to achieve. For me, the true me measurement True measurement helps define campaigns, monitor their progress, and then provides evidence of the impact that you've achieved or not achieved. So I use the integrated measurement evaluation framework as a, as a process, as a sort of a, a, a guide to, to plan communications, but also then measure. And the integrated evaluation framework can be found um, on the AMEC website. I use it alongside the Barcelona principles and the AMEC framework, it's a, it, you can see it as a process, a funnel, um, maybe not as scientific as some people in science would believe, but it is a process and a process can be, you can use it to, to sort of drive content through, drive data through, to come out the other end differently or give you a guide as to what you've found. The boss draw on the principles, just to give you a bit of a heads up on that. There are a set of principles that were agreed by academics and measurement specialists back in 2010 from around the world. And now they're on the third iteration. The framework is made up of the following components. So it, there, you, you can see that there, there's several components to it. There's planning, there's implementation, and then there's evaluation and measurement. You can, I just, I reverse that, and I say that you, you look at it from the impact and then link your impact back through the golden thread to the objectives, measured objectives. So what you're trying to do is define a clear link between what your campaign, what impact you want to achieve and the measurable objectives and strategy. So if you start with the impact in mind, you hopefully you should be onto a winning entry when you actually nominate an award or put in an entry. I believe good, effective, value-driven communication starts with the impact in mind, and then you work backwards from there. And although there's nothing visible, I just call it a golden thread because the two need to link to have the right outcome, to have the right impact. So if you think about the impact that you want from any com campaign, content you've shared, message you've relayed, and then you link that back to your strategy and objectives and your purpose, then inevitably you will have the right outcome. And as Lee has already shared, the campaigns which went on to win were the ones that were outcome driven, insight led, and not just tactics and creativity and output focused. There was meaning behind the creativity, there was meaning behind the strategy for them to go on to win. Measurable, Measurement and data shouldn't be a way of just keeping score, the vanity metrics, you know, thought and process that some people apply. It should be a way of better understanding of communications, content, information that we've shared is effective, adding value to the end user's experience. And the question we should be asking ourselves as communications practitioners is, as a result of the content we've shared, has our audience has our, sorry, uh, has our audience had a meaningful experience? So outputs, outputs 
of the content I or we share and receive by the audience and the, the tactics, uh, tactics and the activity. So the outcomes are what I want my audience to understand, know, feel and do differently or not do differently. Impact is the result. So output plus outcomes equals impact. So how do you enter an award-winning campaign? Increase the focus from, for sort of from outcome, output focus to outcomes. So reverse that. So we want outcomes to be 96% and outputs to be 32 percent change to what you know change what happened as a result of and not rely on the tactics and activities alone we need to move away from vanity metrics and begin by setting measurable uh, objectives and boss learner principles the first principle talks about setting measurable goals as a prerequisite to comms planning and measurement and evaluation if we can't measure objectives we're going to str struggle to then determine the success because they're, they're subjective, because you've not set something that's objective. Dan Bartholomew, who sadly isn't with us anymore, and it was in his time a bit of a measurement and evaluation guru, wrote a blog called Metrics Man, and they've turned it into a book now, um, observed two main reasons why PI campaigns had poorly written objectives. One was objectives weren't specific or time bound to help with measurement they weren't smart so specific measurable time bound achievable and secondly objectives and strategy were confused so if we try and remember that an objective is the impact we want to achieve the end goal then we 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 plan and measure and set them accordingly according to and also there's two ele vital elements of the SMART framework the objective should have. Specifically, this, sorry, uh, mainly the specific target you hope to achieve and the time frame you want and plan to uh, achieve it in. A poor objective, for example, would be just to say you want to increase awareness in, for the example of safety. So you just want to increase in a safety campaign, you just want to increase uh, the safety uh, awareness but a measurable objective would be to actually give give it more specific um, measurable uh, a time uh, and put a time frame on it so you'd say you want to decrease accidents which is specific and the time frame is from in the first in the next quarter going down from 20 percent to five or 20 to 5. We tend to confuse objectives as I refer, uh, sorry, uh, with so that the impact and with strategy, so output. There's an easy way to differentiate and remember the difference between an objective and strategy. So objective is what you want to accomplish, so the impact of your campaign, content shared, message relayed. Strategy is the how, you intend to achieve that objective and your tactic is more your outputs what tools you're going to use what channels you're going to use what method you're going to use to to do that the other thing that uh, Bartholomew in his one of his blogs uh, he was asked to judge awards and his research very similar to Lee's he did some research on the awards he was asked to judge and he found three main oversights of the ones that didn't get through, that were unsuccessful. So in these cases, the objectives were measurable. So they, how do you measure? They talked about raising awareness. So how do you measure that? Again, it's subjective. It's not objective. Secondly, strategy were confused with objectives. Objectives are what we want to achieve. And the strategy is your how. And then he found that measurement was misaligned. So this is where that golden thread between objectives and impact, impact back up to objectives. So they'd, they'd misaligned in that, you know, so for instance, or for example, you want to change behavior. We can't demonstrate how successful that's been by the number of impressions on a, a you know, a, or hits on a website or an intranet the campaign generated. 
success would be measured if you could actually measure the impact of the and aligning the objectives with the impact via that golden thread. So why have I shared a picture of a pizza? Uh, the reason I shared this is because uh, there's no pizza available. I'm sorry, the end of this <laughs> session. The reason I've, I've just, for me, communication is about storytelling and it's the sum of the parts and, and it's going back to that sort of the AMEC framework, the, the wheel. Good effective storytelling includes all of these parts and to have the impact or to have a narrative that you can share a meaningful narrative, meaningful storytelling, you need all the sum of the parts to work and, and to go through all of, the, you know, every element of that process has got a, a part to play. I, I, you know, sort of, I use data to improve the communication and content storytelling I share to continuously improve that, to understand if the communication is effective. I hope if there's one take, key takeaway that you take from today, no pun intended, um, there's no pizza. <laughs> it's, it's the ability to see clearly that golden thread between measurable objectives and impact, that you start off on the right footing by setting measurable objectives so you can identify your outputs, the outcomes and the desired impact. You use measurement and evaluation to improve that story to help tell a better and more meaningful story. And I'll hand over to Nafisa. Thank you. Um, so you've done this amazing campaign. You've done some amazing work. Um, now it's time to think about how you will write your nomination. Um, I know Lee and Adiza have already talked about storytelling, um, but I think from a judge's point of view, it's really important to think about how, uh, sorry, from a writer's point of view, it's really important to think about how a judge is feeling when they are reading your entry. So a judge will read lots of different entries. How do you make yours stand out? We've got this amazing quote on here and it's all about how you make people feel. And that's something that people don't forget. Um, and that's through storytelling. Um, so storytelling has the power to engage, influence, teach and inspire. Um, that's why we argue that organisations should build a storytelling culture and that they should play storytelling at the heart of what they do, um, whether that's communicating change, whether that's within their marketing or within their own learning programmes. When you're writing your entry, think about how you can use storytelling within your actual nomination as well, so within your entry. Um, we all know good stories. Um, we've known them since we were young. And increasingly, business books are using storytelling techniques to help re, uh, help the reader understand like really complex points. So if you look at my uh, Matthew Said's Rebel Ideas or Brené Brown's Dare to Lead, they're using a lot of storytelling techniques to get their points across and to help you understand. Um, there's lots, lots of reasons for this. Um, before we look at what you should be doing, um, let's look at the science of a non-story. Um, so usually, when you have a nomination or when you're writing your entry, you will write a document that will be made of lots of sentences, lots of bullet points. There's lots of words that we have in there. So only down in the creative part where we start to add images, we start to have links to videos, for example. When you're writing those entries, they're really meaningful to you. So to, to the actual writer or the person that's managed that campaign or led it or whoever signed it off. Um, but that often means that it lacks the same punch for the audience, so for the actual judge. So when the judge is reading about your entry or reading through your entry, what they're doing is they're starting to tick off those bullet points and those sentences. That engages the language processing parts of your brain only. So that gets to work. And what happens is those bullet points, those sentences that you have written down, the judge will actually start to find their own meaning within them. So the actual problem with that is that what happens is the judge then comes up with a story in their own mind, and that might not actually be the story that you intended to write. So when you're talking about a campaign and you've written your bullet points and you've given your examples, the judge will start to form their own opinions before they've even got to the end where you've talked about your outcomes, for example. So the idea is to, to write it in a format 
that actually helps um, keep them engaged and helps to create that story for them and get the point across that you wanted to convey. Um, so how do we do that? Um, Leo Wildrich in his, uh, in his book, The Science of Storytelling, um, he said that stories deliver, uh, if you deliver the same information using the story, not only are the language, the language processing parts of your brain activated, but multiple parts of your brain are activated as well. So again, think about your judge here, think about when it is that they might be reading your entry, think about you know, what else might be going on, how do you want your story to stick, how do you want your campaign to stick in your mind. You know, I last year we judged between lots of work meetings, I was reading applications, um, you know, in the evening when we were trying to settle the kids, for example. What you want is you want to ensure that your entry is memorable to somebody. So um, by engaging multiple parts of the brain, um, the judge starts to experience the story, which then helps it stick. So that was the science. There's lots more on that and I have to share more if anybody wants any more information on that. Um, let's look at when you're actually writing your entry then. Um, so how do you use storytelling techniques in your award entry? First, you consider the structure of your nomination. So consider how you will write the entry. Some, some nominations, uh, some entries will, you know, you'll have a format to follow, but really think about actually, this is what I want to write here. This is how I want to end. This is the last thing that I want to end with. Um, and there are lots of different ways that you can tell a story. The f I've, I've pulled out four popular models here. So the first is the, hero, the hero's journey. Think about Disney here. I think we'll, we'll all know Disney, we'll all know all of the stories we've heard since we were younger. So um, in 1949, Joseph Campbell defined that the hero's journey has three acts to it. So the first is the departure act. Um, so that's when the hero is leaving home, they're pledging to return home when, you know, they've saved the day. Um, Marvel, Batman, most of them are doing similar things, um, just in very different styles. Um, then think about act two. So the hero has gone through all of those uh, treacherous and unknown territories, you know, there's wars, there's, there, there's all the, the villains that come and think, again, I'm thinking superhero world at the moment. But think about all the trials and tests that you might have gone through. If you're thinking about a campaign, and I know Lee will be talking about one sooner, um, later, but think about, for example, you know, the, the research that you've conducted, the people that you've talked to, the different, uh, the different audiences that you've engaged through the process, you know, how, how you've kept them engaged, how, why was that difficult, how it was difficult, and try to tell that story. And then there's the return act. So this is usually your outcome, your impact. So how, your, how the hero in this incident was triumphant. So um, they've gone away, they've won the day, they've come back home and you know, they're, they're, they're in full glory. Um, so that, that's generally a format that we're all quite aware of. The next one, I think Lee skipped ahead now, Sorry. is the bridge. He's like, just get it over with. We've talked about the hero <laughs> now, that's it. <laughs> Um, so the, you need to go back. So the next is the bridge. So I'm just going through four here, but again, Google will give you lots of different examples. Um, but there's the before after uh, the before after bridge. Um, so this is the before where you show your readers um, what the problem is and what the issue is and what you're trying to solve. Um, the after would be where you're trying to tell the um, the judge what the world would be like if the problem was solved. So this is where you start to describe the future world. So think about your campaign. Once you've talked about um, your objective, start talking about what it is that you were trying to solve, what, what that impact looks like. Um, why would it be interesting for people? Why, why would your audiences, for example, benefit from it? And then, you, uh, then there's the bridge. This is the, here's how to get there. Um, and this is what we actually did in this instance. So, um, once you know what that before and after uh, looks like, it's about giving your solution. Um, so telling that story of what it is that you actually did. And again, Lee will go through an example of a campaign and you'll start to pick up points. Um, this can be quite linear. Some people will do a, you know, one, two, three. Some people will start uh, jotting this around. So again, just think about what format works for you and how you will keep um, the judge engaged. The next one, and this is um, used a lot in marketing, is the ADA model. Um, so this is attention, interest, desire, and action. Um, so first, attention, um, you grab your audience's attention. You don't have long for this. 
again, think about marketing, think about ad campaigns here. Um, but it's about not having like huge long paragraphs at the beginning of your uh, of, of your entry. You know, just get to the point with it as well. Use short, snappy sentences, you know, keep the information accessible, make it easy for the judge to go through. Again, think about interviews as well and applications that you might have put through. It, it's similar things that you, you know, you're using in everyday business as well and personal life. Um, number two is then generating interest. Um, so uh, talk about your audience, um, think about what your judge might be interested in. In this case, go back to the criteria, the AMEC, AMEC criteria, the Barcelona principles, think about that whole plan, planning process. This is the interest that, uh, you know, the, the judges will have criteria and you'll have access to these. Uh, it, you, you should focus your application and your story around that, not what it is that you want to get across. Um, again, I, I refer to this point as um, going back to interviews. Usually, if you've ever sat through a competency interview or if, you, if you're a hiring manager at any point, you will start to tick off things against the criteria. And usually the advice we give to people is use business speak, use words that, that the judges might be familiar with in this instance. Um, third is to then awaken your audience's desire. So what you want is you want them to be curious you want them to start thinking about, oh, what possible solution might, might this person have to offer so that they keep reading. Um, and usually this is where people stop. So if you go back to Lee's, uh, Lee's percentages on outcomes, people stop talking about outcomes. They get through to the tactics, you know, they, they put a lot of effort in the, in the entries in the tactics part. But actually, when it gets to the outcomes, there's a bit of writer's fatigue as well. So, so, so they don't give that part of the application that much attention. Um, so once you've got the attention, once you've got interest and once you've built desire, think about the action at the end. How do you want your story to conclude? How do you want your entry to conclude so that the audience knows what you did and how you did it? Um, so it's, again, really simple concept, but it is about the structure of it. And the final one is, and I've got a bit of a pinky promise here. We had a pinky promise with the kids yesterday. So um, this picture worked for me. But the final one is the four Ps. So the four Ps are promise, picture, proof, and push. So the promise, this is where you start. So make a promise to your audience to catch their attention. Um, you, again, talk about um, you know, the problem that you're trying to fix in the first place. So, Again, the objectives, think about how you're going to word them. Um, then you start to paint a picture. So it should be vibrant. It should be descriptive. Use engaging language. Use language, again, that is accessible. I, I, um, I always say I use plain language. Uh, it works in a lot of our comms just because of the type of audiences that I work with um, and the channels that we use. But generally, from a day-to-day -day point of view as well, I will use lots of plain language because it makes it easier to engage somebody. Um, you don't, you're, not, you're not getting somebody to go away and Google what a particular word we So think about the words that you're using. Um, when you're painting the picture, what you're also doing is you're getting the judge to start imagining things like your problems, but also the benefits and your desired outcomes as well. Then you move on to proof. Um, so once you've given your promise, once you've uh, painted a picture, you've set a bit of a tone um, for your actual reader. Um, this is the point where you start to talk about what it is that you actually did. So give the proof about your claims, the points, this can include statistics, this can include graphs, this uh, site studies, you know, this is where you show what the benefits were, but also your own credibility. So again, put a lot of effort into this part because this is where you will start to stand out against your competitors. Um, and then final is the push. Um, Again, this is the call to action at the end. This is where you want to encourage and persuade people that what it is that you did was worthy of winning. So again, think about what it is that you say here. How do you stand out um, within your application or within the anatomy? Um, so there are just four, point, uh, four examples but there. But again, if you, if you Google storytelling techniques, you will find loads and loads. And just go through what works for you you'll find that depending on what campaign you're working on, some things will, you know, something will fit, something might not fit. So just uh, have a bit of a play around with them, how you structure it. Um, 
And then the second part of writing your application is about the words that you include. Um, so I've already said that I tend to use more accessible words, words that are simple and easy to understand, words that are a bit more emotive. Um, consider your words. Um, words can inspire and words can also destroy. So this is a Canadian writer, Robin Sharma. Um, he advises that you choose your words well. Um, words have the power to make or break your entry. So choose your words really carefully. Um, think about sensory details that you might be adding um, in here. Again, it, it, it's to trigger different parts of the judge's brain. Um, so for example, the customer was ex uh, as excited as if they had won the lottery. You already instinctively, if, you, if you've heard that as well, that sentence, you'll start to imagine what it feels like to have won the lottery, to have won something or to won a prize. So again, that part of your brain is already triggered. Um, and then think about action words as well. Um, you want to drive this project home. That, that engages the multicortex. So it's a different part of your brain, which then starts to help you create a more connected and richer experience. So think about the structure and think about the words um, so that you can help keep your judges engaged as well. Um, it's, it's always important to think about your audiences. You know, we talk about it in all different levels of comms, but, you know, think about it from a judge's point of view. Like I said, they will be going through countless entries. Um, if you're structuring your entry well, if you're using the right type of words to keep them engaged, um, what that does is it helps judges to find meaning and sense in your submission. It helps judges to form and examine their own beliefs and separate them from um, the nominee's beliefs. So it helps them to park their biases aside sometimes and park away things like, I would have been done this this way, um, because you know that, that comes in everybody's mind. Um, it helps them to gain new and better understandings and perspectives as well. And what it does is it helps the judge to understand the world through the nominee's lens instead. Um, so see the world through your eyes and then see what you did um, via the campaign and the outcomes and everything that you've gone through. It will help the judge to experience that and really live that um, as they're reading your entry. I think I'm handing back to Lee now. So that was just... Sorry, I missed the slide there, didn't I? Sorry, uh -huh. Lucia. It, it's Apologies. fine. Um, but if anybody wants to get in touch, we can, we can talk about it in a bit more detail. But... Again, um, just think about the words, think about the structure. We, we talk about it in comms all the time. Think about it in your entries as well. Brilliant. Fantastic. Some, some really brilliant insights there from Adiba and Nafisa. And um, I'm just going to wrap up here with uh, a, a real life campaign example um, that, that, that was delivered by uh, our, our consultancy, Evergreen, for a brilliant uh, organization, so the British Tinnitus Association, who are looking to, ultimately their mission is to support people who have tinnitus, which is a, a hearing condition, um, and to help bring forward a day when cures can be found. Uh, this, this campaign won numerous uh, awards, so it felt like quite a good example to, to reflect on against some of the lessons that, that we've, we've learned today. So I'll just um, work through work through this campaign, but also and highlighting it against the various criteria that we met. So from uh, looking back at those those six criteria from the beginning, so objective setting, um, what did we do in this campaign? So we we made sure that the judges understood what tinnitus is and the scale of the challenge uh, that was in front of us, and to to bring you all up to speed on on that is that. Uh, Tinnitus is the perception of noise in the ear or head that has no external source. It's a, it's a condition that's often trivialized, but it's also really common and affects one in eight people and is known to have quite a severe impact on mental health and quality of life in some cases. So we made sure that the judges understood, understood the, um, the barriers and the challenges that we had and, and, and what, what this condition is, is all about really. We described an impact focused objective. So for us in this case, it was securing a review of tinnitus research funding. So we made that front and center. That was our, our target outcome impact objective. And then we also set a, a variety of smart objectives uh, underneath those that were measurable, specific, timed. Uh, things like uh, we wanted political support, 
via the creation of an APPG within 18 months. We wanted at least two press articles in the national media, and there were various others underneath there that we felt if we secure all of these um, smart data-led uh, objectives, then that will lead to the or, or lead us on the road to the target outcome. So that was objective setting, and then we moved on to um, research and planning. So, in terms of our entry and this and this section we described first off described the frameworks and approaches we used so in in the case of this particular campaign we did a literature review of academic studies uh, that were identified by the uh, by the charity's chief executive uh, that helped us to understand the the position and the um, what evidence was already out there that this needed to the situation needed to change we did, as we always do, um, a power interest stakeholder analysis to understand the, the potential for each of our target audience groups and channels to help us achieve the target outcome, and then how difficult it would be to get each of them on board so that we could look at each in isolation and ensure that the strategy uh, was, was developed to, to convince the most important uh, channels or levers. That, and we did a pestle analysis to un understand the external context, uh, the wider story, what would hit well with the media, um, what are the big uh, topics and conversations in, within politics and health at the moment. Um, but more importantly, we, we looked at that insight um, and, uh, and defined what, what were the key learnings from all that research that shaped the direction that we took the campaign in. And there are a few key things for us so we found that the tinnitus community uh, was sizable and passionate, uh, but there was a lack of a unified voice. So, so people were often, or different organizations were potentially pulling in different directions and what was needed was, uh, was a unified voice. We also found some great um, statistics from the, from the literature review, uh, things like eight out of 10, people being unhappy with their with their treatment options available um, and research into tinnitus receiving 40 times less funding than comparable conditions and we built this whole sort of evidence base um, behind why there was a real need for change in this particular area uh, which gave us strong foundations to build the campaign on and then we identified a lot of influential people that perhaps hadn't been engaged in the discussion before but by changing the conversation to be about research, research funding were very relevant. So that research really, we spent a good deal of time on that and that set the foundations for the whole of the rest of the campaign, which I think is, is, is the right way to do things. Um, and then from a strategy point of view, we wanted to show that our action plan was informed by the insight. So in response to the insight saying that there was a lack of a unified voice, we decided to bring together various different stakeholders. So in this case, it included politicians, research funders, uh, people with tinnitus, um, charity groups to uh, to all discuss uh, and, and sorry, academics to all discuss the, the current situation with tinnitus research and what the future direction should be. And as a result, to develop a shared vision for tinnitus research. So that was the first part of our strategy, a shared vision. Uh, and then secondly, we wanted to, um, we knew that to make a change, to get people to take an action, to have an impact, we needed uh, to create something that would get the attention of the people that had the power to influence change. So we, uh, our whole campaign was about dialing up the emotional impact of, of tinnitus as a condition and packaging our campaign for a range of audiences. So uh, a strong hook for the media, a, a petition that allowed the public to engage, briefing notes for politicians and an in-depth uh, scientific led white paper report, which gave the whole thing credibility because it showed um, that the back ground behind it and included those shared that shared vision of calls to action and all these things would be designed to create pressure for change from a tactics point of view um you know every, every, as we as we said in the research everybody does this does this well it's the it was essentially the list of activities that we undertook uh, and why we did them as Nafisa talked about earlier on so 
Um, in our case, we we booked the we booked the House of Commons uh, as an event because it's uh, an appealing venue and would attract people uh, convenient for people in London, but also attractive for people who maybe you know haven't visited um, Parliament before. We did a survey of 1600 people with tinnitus and we got a brilliant statistic that showed um, one in 10 uh, people have had um, a, a severe impact in, in mental health and had thoughts of suicide or self-harm, which was a really strong, um, a powerful media hook, which showed the need for something to change. Uh, and that was our central hook, which, which we used to gain the attention of the media. Uh, we then identified a, a relevant case study um, who applied via the charity uh, and they were really passionate about raising awareness and we worked with them to develop a suite of, of assets and, and materials that again had a really really sort of powerful um, impact uh, on, the, on in terms of communicating that message. Uh, and then creativity and, and innovation. So there's a pressure within uh, PR, marketing, and, and, and the, these various uh, professions around it to be like super creative. Um, and we all see fantastic creative campaigns uh, on social media and think, oh, I wish I'd done that. Um, but I think when, when, we look, when we look at creativity, it's, in, it's in really important to think, what is it? What is it that's really important? Uh, and when when you are doing a campaign to deliver a change the important thing isn't how creative it is or how smart or, or pretty or clever the creative was it was the most important thing is what impact did you have and i think there if you reframe creative as as innovation you it possibly allows you to be a bit more impact focused because it's not just about being creative it's about what is it that you did how did you innovate within your campaign, but focused and targeted on the outcome you wanted to achieve? Uh, and in our example, uh, so this isn't the most creative campaign you would ever see, but but it was it was impactful. Uh, and what um, from a creativity point of view, what we focused on was that we were the first uh, to bring together this disparate group of stakeholders and to succeed uh, in working with them to develop a shared vision for Tinnitus Research we uh, we maximized what we had so we maximized the impact of our brilliant um, and motivated case study uh, and she develops the, this excellent homemade uh, video which was because it was homemade it was kind of raw and emotionally powerful um, and we also worked with her so that the petition that was accompanying the campaign didn't come from the charity uh, but came from her so she told her personal story and she launched the petition. Uh, and that's something that came from a conversation with uh, change.org that, uh, that, that the T British Tennis Association had. And that made that campaign, that was a great way to utilize what we had in a more creative way that was more engaging and more emotive. And then uh, how did we adapt, you know, creativity, innovation? How, how did we adapt to opportunities as they arose? Uh, which again, shows a certain level of creativity and openness. Uh, and in our case, on the day of the round table event at the House of Commons, uh, we saw that there was a debate around um, healthcare and, and what needs to change. And we briefed our parliamentary sponsor, uh, Sir John Hayes MP, uh, who was a former cabinet member to to go up and ask a question and and, uh, and you know in in the hotel in, sorry in the House of Commons lobby kind of developed the question for him he went and asked the question and uh, it was uh, and that kind of kick started the campaign and created uh, a momentum because it was on on the radar of the Secretary of State Matt, Matt Hancock at the time uh, so that really kick started things and we were able to build on things from there. And then outcome, uh, as both Adiba and Nafisa have said, this is arguably the most important section. You know, this is what happened as a result of what you did. And, and if you can show the golden thread that led to this all the way through the rest of the work that you did in the campaign, and then show the outcome, that, that's absolutely crucial. And in our case, we were able to show uh, and link to evidence that the Department of Health had set up a new small working group to discuss tinnitus research funding um, as a direct result of the campaign 
um, and uh, our client, the British Genitals Association, was invited to be one of the, the members of that committee. So that, that discussion is now happening. So we achieved the objective, the, the key outcome that we were looking for. And then from a supporting point of view, we got various different measurable uh, impact measures. So 135,000 people signed that petition saying that there needs to be more research for tinnitus funding. Uh, we instigated the first ever tinnitus debate in the House of Lords. There were meetings with uh, research, two major research funders for, for the charity, which again is a real big step forward. We got a lot of press coverage, so 20 plus tier one media articles. I'm not sure what the reach was. I'm not sure we included that in there. Um, I'm not sure that's particularly important for, from our point of view. It was more about you know, getting a big piece in the Times, uh, which is well read by politicians, um, and having the credibility of that. We appeared on ITV News and various other places. So it was more the levers that we were pushing. Uh, and then we got this fantastic testimonial quote from our clients saying that uh, that the our consultancy had helped them deliver the most successful campaign in in, the his, in its history, uh, and all those things together um, is, is I think why that campaign won won those awards. It was it was had a had a strong cause. Um, it was insight led. There was a clear strategy. The tactics were well implemented. There was creativity, but within uh, the, the confines of the campaign and targeted at the outcome. And then we achieved these really brilliant outcomes, um, which showed that the campaign was worth doing because it had the impact that we'd set out at the beginning. Thank, thanks very much. Um, and I think that brings us to the end of the session. Um, and we were gonna invite questions for the panel. So. There is a question in the chat, Lee. Um, it's by Louis. Sorry, I know we are slightly over, but I just thought we'd cover it. There's only one there. Um, it goes back to the, the point about award winning teams. Um, so, is there some research to back up the traits of award winning teams? Louise Turner says she would be interested if you have any information. Brilliant. Um, I'll I'll take a look, Louise. I think it was more a sort of composite of various um, blog articles and opinion pieces rather than sort of hard statistics. But I'll take a look back, and if we've if we've got that um, as data or or a couple of links that we can send over, I'm more than happy to to attach that to the end of the uh, the presentation deck when we circulate it. Um, Laura is asking: Can the panel talk a little? Bit about working in partnership with clients and corporate objectives. Do you want to take that, Adiva, or do you want to take that, Lee? So, sorry, I was just going to say, um, I've worked in-house and it's uh, always, for me, it is remembering that link back to the, the objectives. So it's always making sure that the strategy and the objectives are clear when we're communicating change, communicating information, that there is that clear link from what you want. Always start with the end in mind. And that's what I've always, whenever I've been asked to uh, communicate something, the question back to the client, back to uh, who's asking you to communicate is always, what is the impact you want from this communication? And then work backwards and link it back to your values, your purpose, the organization's strategy and objectives. Because, and I, maybe I should say this, or I shouldn't say this, because if there is no link, then why are we communicating it? That's a question that us as communications practitioners should be asking uh, our clients, our, you know, the MD, the CEO, if we're asked to communicate something, share some content, then there needs to be that clear link to strategy and objectives. And if there isn't, have we got enough um, power to, to go back uh, to say, well, why are we communicate? Why do you want to communicate? There isn't a link that there's no need for that message. It's just for the sake of communicating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would just add to that. Uh, I think um, oh, we'll come on to that one, Laura. I think I think in terms of uh, working from a, from a consultancy perspective, I think it's really important, uh, Adiba touched on purpose there. I think it's really important 
for consultants to work with or for organizations that align with their purpose yeah. uh, and, and what they believe uh for, and from our perspective the way the way we do that is that we 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 want to have an uh, an improve we want to help improve people's health you know, we our agency is set up to transform people's health and therefore we work with only work with organizations that can help us to achieve that which means our objectives are often um completely aligned from the very beginning and i think that puts you in a in a really strong starting mm -hmm. place and then i think it's about understanding what are the business outcomes underneath that purpose for the, org the organization or the client has that will help them to 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 achieve that that purpose of improving people's health because every health organization in, in our in our industry that i'm speaking specifically on will have that same sort of purpose so what are the business objectives that will help them to to do what they ultimately want to do as an organization like the corporate purpose if you like and i think um just adding to that slightly sometimes how we position things in comms as well and when we're pushing back um so within higher education my team work with lots of different stakeholders if we said what what impact do you want to have or do you know what is your objective we tend to hear their services objective so again thinking about councils here thinking about public sector or even thinking about um you know other organizations you'll start to drill down into what specific teams have or what specific um services have as an objective it's sometimes how do you step away from that and say, okay, what is it that you want to achieve? So sometimes it's just playing about with the words that you're using when you are talking to clients, when you are talking to senior management or when you're talking to stakeholders. It, it's, it's helping them understand what you're trying to get to. Um, mm -hmm. So we have something in, um, so we manage student comms and we have lots of different teams feeding into us. Um, often we're just, just asked to send something out there isn't a reason behind it. So when we've automated that a bit, we, we've got people to start filling in the form. And part of it is to say, how do you know you will be successful? How do you know getting this information out will do what it needs to do for you? Um, so we start to understand, you know, the impact of the objectives. We also then tie that back down, back to our strategy. We've got our strategy divided up into three key areas, for example. So we start to say, okay, is it the community aspect of it? So we work with staff and students, we're building that sense of belonging. Is it part of that? Is it, is it part of another aspect? So um, we start to then tie back and we then push back based on um, what it is. And, and that's something we're doing across um, the communications team. So it's not just in student comms, but it's an internal comm where we're dealing with the employee engagement, but also with media work as well. So when we're getting um, asked, asked to push things out through the media, that, that's something that we, we've been on a journey to do in the last couple mm -hmm. of years as well. And change doesn't happen overnight as well. So you need to think about how you will start embedding it um, in the work that you're doing. Yeah, I, I, I would add, I think organisations, in terms of that vanity metrics point, organisations have a responsibility, I think, to themselves and to, the, and to any partner agencies or consultants they work with they have a responsibility really to be open and to share the data uh, you know what's the, what is their current where where are they trying to get to what mm. is their current starting position if you don't know those two things and there's not um a mutual sharing of the data and insights then then how will you know that, that you, what you're doing i mean and the other thing is that pr is about um you know best practices about evaluating the what the activity as you go and if you don't have access to the data then you don't know which bits you're doing that are working and you can't adapt your plan accordingly so i think it's 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 really an education piece about yeah going back to what what they're trying to achieve um and, and making it really clear that if they want to see that kind of an impact then they need to give you the whole story so yeah. that so that you can show them what you're doing and how that's moving them along that journey yeah. really yeah, um, I'd agree. I, I think it is focusing on the impact and the outcomes rather than the outputs. And I think the, the more we can move clients and prospective clients and even in-house, you know, the MD and CEO to that sort of that space and that thinking that there is more to uh, measurement and evaluation than vanity metrics because they, they have got a, a role to play because they give you a measurement, but it's, 
it, you need more than that. You want to answer the question why. You know, clicks is good because it's given you a measurement, but then you want to know why somebody has clicked on something or not clicked on it. So I think it's more looking at the, the qualitative uh, data and trying to move into that space, having those conversations. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Oh, I've gone a bit wappy on here. Um, so I think we, uh, are we kind of running um, slightly over? I don't know if there are any more uh, further questions in here. Yeah. No, we... Twitter is open for anybody, if anybody's Twitter got any questions. Open. Yeah, yeah. Twitter is always open, LinkedIn as well. Um, emails, whatever works for you. If you want to get in touch, just, just drop us a message and we can have a chat. Brilliant. Yeah, that's great. So I think if we will we'll just... Everybody. Yeah. yeah, thank you everyone for attending. Um, thank you, Nafisa and Adiba, for, for, for joining the session. Um, we've recorded it, so hopefully that's worked uh, and it will be made available on YouTube uh, and we think be made available on the CIPR's CPD database as well. So, yeah, thank you very much and um, uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoons. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.